Good morning. Um, thanks everyone for being here. I'm uh, Reed Kramer. I direct the asset building program at New America. And um, our program focuses on an, an array of issues related to uh, economic uh, security and mobility. And in this work, we've been paying pretty close attention to the impacts of the Great uh, Recession. And it really became clear to us that the recession has had a particularly severe impact on, on young adults. So along with our co-conveners, Young Invincibles, and the Roosevelt Campus Network, uh, I'd like to welcome you here to this cross-cutting policy symposium entitled Millennials Rising, Next Generation Policies in the Wake of the Great Recession. And our goal is really to convene uh, an evidence-based discussion that looks at the new realities that uh, millennial Americans are facing and then explore a public policy response. So we're very much looking forward to the exchange with all of you over the next day and a half. Um, at the onset here, I, I want to just acknowledge a lot of uh, colleagues and, and, and uh, collaborators and staff that have worked on, on organizing this gathering. Uh, my, my New America colleagues have been great. Uh, Rachel Black, Elliot Schur, uh, Holly uh, Russin gilman Thorn Ellen McCain, and Liana Simmons have uh, just been invaluable. Uh, Liana did a great job with this space. We're very happy to be here, um, aiming for something a little offbeat here in the DC policy world. So I think we maybe hit the mark. Um, and then at Young Invincibles, uh, Jennifer uh, Wang and Jen Mishori, Rory O'Sullivan have been great. And um, Taylor Joe Eisenberg at the Roosevelt Campus Network. Taylor, are you here? Don't you? OK, hi, hi, thank you. Um, We've actually only met over the phone and email, so great to have her here. Um, the initial idea for the convening was hatched uh, by New America in collaboration with Ray Bashera, who uh, works at a center, runs the center on um, household financial stability at the St. Louis Fed. And it was their work that explored the dynamics of the family balance sheet that really revealed a lot of the severity of the impacts on younger uh, families. And their research showed that the Great Recession really wasn't your garden variety economic downturn. The economy lost almost 9 million jobs. The unemployment rate hit post-war highs, along with the long-term unemployment rate that remains elevated. Uh, household wealth dropped almost uh, or over uh, $16 trillion uh, from its peak. And even if we might have expected some of this uh, loss of wealth to occur when uh, the bursting of the asset bubble, uh, the recovery has certainly been slow and very disappointing. There's really been no return to normal for many uh, families, many individuals. And there really is a generational component to this story. Millennials are having a difficult time gaining their footing in the economy. They're now on a very different trajectory than previous generations. With greater obstacles in accessing some of the basic building blocks of, of success, or what previously had been the, the building blocks of success, getting the right education, finding uh, the right job, raising a family, managing finances, even participating uh, politically. So the conceit of this gathering was that there seems to be little recognition to the millennial generation experience, to the unique circumstances that they're facing. And we've really been left with a big disconnect between their experience and the public policy response. So our intention is to really examine this gap and explore a new set of policies that meet both the moment and also the aspirations of members of this uh, generation. I also want to acknowledge there are a lot of limitations in using a generational framework. Uh, um, there is a huge diversity of experience that's out there. There's also maybe some art to it as opposed to some of the science and some of the rigor. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that, and we can talk about that throughout the, uh, the session here. But I think there's also some, some advantages. Um, and you know, there is a prevailing worldview that might uh, be emerging, shaped by a shared experience, um, including the attitudes of parents that uh, were responsible for raising the generation. Some noted uh, generational scholars, such as Neil Howell and William Strauss, uh, were very early in identifying this new phenomenon of, of the millennial generation. Uh, in their book, their 2000 book, uh, called Millennials Rising, where we got the name for the symposium. And they called the, the, this a good news gen uh, revolution, because the children that they were observing 
uh, about to head off uh, to adulthood to college were, were actually inclined to behave a lot better than their predecessors were. They were really breaking the mold of disillusioned youth. Um, they were committed to building up new social institutions rather than tearing down uh, old ones. They weren't seen as selfish and narcissistic like the boomers or um, uh, profane and risk-taking on the edge uh, like the Gen Xers. And there's some Gen Xers in the audience too, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, they were seen as cohesive. They were seen as hopeful. They were comfortable as team players. They wanted to participate. They wanted to engage. Everyone was rewarded for showing up. Everyone got a trophy just for participating. And according to Hal, uh, and that wasn't the, the case when I was a kid. Only the winning team got a trophy. Um, anyway, uh, millennials, the, the sunny disposition that, that, that emerged was, was a product of a larger society that was feeling better about having children. Children were sought after. They were, they were wanted. And then they were, they were looked after, too. This is the advent of the helicopter parent. The parent was ready to swoop in at, at a moment's notice. So they weren't ignored. They were people invested in them. Uh, and as a result, uh, the millennials grew up not trying to, je to kind of question authority. They respected authority. They wanted to know what the rules were. They were tolerant. They were accepting of differences. They were achievement-oriented. Um, and anyway, these are some of the, the generalizations that are thrown out about uh, the, the generation based on some of the, the, the survey work uh, uh, of the day. Uh, interestingly, their experience with technology was, was unique. They grew up, every generation grows up with technology, but this one was connecting people in new ways and, you know, prevent, pre presenting kind of a frontier which seemed a lot, they were like boundless uh, possibilities. The future was bright. Um, and you know, as I said, I think there's some challenges in, 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 in these generalizations, but uh, they, 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 they don't cover the diversity of experience that, that I somehow think we want to um, capture. But it did uh, possibly explain the birth boom, the, the pro-child uh, sentiment explains the birth boom that, that has made the millennials the largest cohort uh, in, uh, in the country. And if we look at anyone born between 1982 and 2002, millennials are 85 million strong. Demographically, they're the most diverse generation in American history, racially and ethnically. Uh, they've been influenced by the wave of Hispanic and Asian uh, immigration. So I think uh, it's around 43% of millennial adults are non-white now. So that's the largest of any, uh, of any generation. And they're so diverse that the, the concept of a typical American is really going to lose its meaning if it already hasn't uh, done so. And I think this is significant because all subsequent policy conversations uh, are going to have to acknowledge the multiculturalism and the diversity uh, of America now. And I think millennials are, are, are on the forefront of this uh, recognition. So today, millennials are now supposed to be entering the, 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 the kind of prime of their, their working lives, uh, approaching their family forming years, but really they're lagging behind previous cohorts. We've had a weak uh, recovery, it's exacerbated inequalities, and it's created pervasive conditions that uh, are, are fostering a downward mobility um, rather than broadly shared prosperity. The job market's been historically bad. Jobs that are offered are going to be uh, flexible uh, and don't provide the same kind of stability. So the road to adulthood has gotten much more arduous. People are redefining their aspirations, they're reordering their priorities, and it's complicating many life decisions, uh, such as marriage, children, even, even home buying. Um, so there's the paradox here. They might have greater discretion in, in, in choices they make, but they have fewer options uh, given their constrained economic uh, prospects. And this is the context for the failure to launch uh, phenomenon. Um, but really, the, the future is not written. And uh, interestingly, millennials remain optimistic about what lies ahead. They have a positive outlook that endures and they're still looking for new pathways uh, to progress. And in this search, that's where there's a role for, for policy. The current policy is not doing enough to support people's uh, choices, to help them participate in the economy, to help young families move up the economic ladder. And at this point, you know, millennial policy is going to be family policy. We're going to have to think about how this works across uh, generations. What's at stake here? Um, 
is, is whether or not the American, American institutions, whether they're in government or in the private sector, can respond to the unique circumstances of the millennial generation and, and do so in ways that are supportive and recognize their, their aspirations, their attitudes, their opinions about uh, the world around them. And we know they support a stronger government. They're open to, to government when it's helping people, when it's leveling the playing field, when it's providing services, when it's improving the economy. Um, but will they be able to coalesce around a far-reaching agenda that can reverse declining mobility, can support them in their family choices, and can cultivate their resiliency? Um, in a few years, they're going to be the overwhelming majority of, of adults in the workforce. Um, in 10 years, there'll be, I think, 75% uh, of the U.S. workforce. But 2025 20, might be too long to wait. And, and we need to think about how to act now. Millennials are no longer just kids, I keep telling uh, people when we talk about this work. Um, they're older than you think, um, but they are uh, still our future. So in the... Uh, um, um, what we're going to do together, with your help and engagement, um, we're going to provide a means to kind of dig a little deeper into some of these phenomena and the issues affecting millennials. Uh, a lot of things are, are treated in isolation. We're going to try to make some connections across uh, policy areas. Uh, we've distributed a booklet uh, that's in your, your packet that has a lot of background uh, materials, trends, data. We're inviting feedback on, um, on that material on those papers. So uh, we'll be able to kind of package them with some other policy ideas that we're also going to be soliciting from you uh, afterwards. We're going to send out an email asking for your policy recommendations and ideas in 500 words uh, or less. And we're going to kind of put this together with some of the discussion that we've had, we'll, we'll have here over the next day and a half. So my hope is that the symposium will be able to incubate and advance a set of cross-cutting uh, policy solutions that can improve the lives of millennials uh, today uh, and in the future. Um, we want to thank uh, all of you here for, for, for being here and a lot of our, our, our sponsors as well. Um, our colleagues are very grateful to the City Foundation, uh, who's really been a key supporter of this gathering and really made it happen. And additional support's been provided by the Annie Casey Foundation, uh, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and the, and the Kaufman Foundation. And uh, we, we appreciate their uh, support. So now I want to bring up Brandy McHale to the uh, podium. She's uh, the Chief Operating Officer of the City Foundation. Foundation. Uh, her work uh, and support has been invaluable. I'll just say, Brandy's been a longtime um, uh, supporter of this work. She's not just a funder. She's a real uh, leader, a thought leader in the inclusive financial services space, the asset building space. Um, she's going to lead a panel later today. But um, thank you, Brandy. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. So. Um, when Reed first uh, approached us about a potential collaboration around this topic, um, we at the City Foundation actually jumped uh, at the chance to participate. First, because we actually know of no better organization than New America for bringing people together and sparking really interesting conversations. And we were also excited about the idea of being able to partner with two organizations, two additional organizations that are really at the forefront of youth issues that we hadn't worked with before. They've actually done a great job, not just lining up a diverse set of partners, but really working together. And I know that Reed highlighted some of the staff, but I really just want to stop and, and again acknowledge and thank the people that made today happen. So thank you very much. Um, you know, so as Reed said, you know, we want to capitalize on all of what you bring to the table today. This isn't kind of a little podium with us speaking at you. This is a chance to have a, a dialogue. Um, and have a dialogue that's kind of solutions focused. Not just talk for the sake of talking, but let's kind of figure out what's the call to action here. And in particular, sort of where does this lead us in terms of our work on, on policy development? Um, for those of you who, for whom this may be the first time you're at a New America event, I'm going to actually take the liberty um, of giving you permission and actually urge all of you that we, we don't want today to be simply an academic conversation, and that's fine. We need to root what we do actually in data and real um, credible information. But what would be really a failure today is if we have a polite conversation. So like, let's not be polite. Let's actually, if you're thinking something, if you disagree with something, let's, that's the kind of dialogue that we want to have today. We want to push back on our assumptions. We want to fuel the debate. And as I said, we want to inspire action. 
And the action piece is hard. You know, I'll just share with you is, is um, I don't know how many of you are um, familiar with the work of the City Foundation, but last year we took a step back to assess our own work in the U.S. and asked ourselves, um, that as the world adapts to the trends of globalization, urbanization, digitization, um, is our philanthropic approach keeping pace? Are we still relevant? And, you know, I'm proud to say that this, you know, asking ourselves this question did not result in our actually, you know, spending several years kind of analyzing what we should do. Um, but it did cause us to, to question whether or not we were emphasizing the right routes to financial success, which has, for us, has been really focused on increasing post-secondary degree attainment, promoting home ownership, and helping individuals adopt positive behaviors that help lead to reduced levels of debt and an increase in short and long-term savings. We're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, we still believe that those roots are really important and they are important paths. But we also recognize, I think the key kind of aha moment was, was that for prior generations, it was almost like a staircase. That each of these milestones as you met them, you sort of achieved another level and then you worked to get to the next level and to get to the next level. And what we're seeing is that for millennials, it's not a staircase, it's actually a meandering path. And, you know, you could say, is that the most efficient and the quickest way for us to get there? Um, I don't know. But I will tell you, I think it's probably way more interesting um, of a process. And what we really want to do is to support millennials by illuminating that path and eliminating obstacles that may stand in their way. Um, I'll just... One quick snippet, as a result of our inquiry, we did just recently launch a new three-year campaign called Pathways to Progress, which is to prepare 100,000 young people across 10 cities to succeed in a 21st century workforce and make sure that they are prepared and ready and able to secure jobs. Um, we're focusing on four pieces of this path, or they could be four paths on this journey. Um, really helping to harness and cultivate an entrepreneurial mindset, leadership and civic engagement, mentorship and meaningful first jobs. Um, and, you know, I want to pick up on something that Reed said. When we launched this campaign, it was born out of the recognition that the future actually isn't necessarily so bleak and filled with bad news for millennials. Um, and in fact, as Reed started to tell us, Millennials probably may have more going for them than the prior generation. So let me just build on a couple points that you made, Reed. First, um, millennials are actually more risk averse. Um, since the 1990s, personal risk taking has plummeted, violent crime is down, drinking and smoking rates are down, and contrary to the popular stereotype, it actually appears that millennials are really trying to avoid economic risks. Um, and again, contrary to the popular stereotype, millennials are not all sitting in coffee shops and developing apps and trying to figure out how to get super rich um, off, of, off of apps. Um, instead, they actually think that job and financial security is important. And I think that Reed started us on a conversation, and I want to have us keep in mind, it's, it's financial security, not financial excess. And the having it all but having it responsibly and thinking about the greater good is something that I think is really defining for this generation. And as a result, what we're seeing in the financial services industry is that millennials are much less likely to have credit card, auto, and housing debt than Gen Xers were a decade ago. Um, the other piece is that while um, the popular media often highlights the millennial who never leaves home, um, the flip side of this story I actually think is a really good one that we haven't really begun to unpack, which is that millennials have much stronger social ties to their families and are creating their own economic and social safety net, one that the public sector cannot provide on its own. And while we know about the high cost of student debt, Let's not forget that millennials are attaining high school and college degrees at a higher rate than any other generation. And if we can promote policies and interventions that allow millennials to do this in the four-year time frame that it should take, this can actually be very, a very productive use of debt that can catapult you to a whole, the next economic level. 
Um, and then I will reiterate what, what Reed said. You know, maybe the most important thing is that um, millennials are optimistic. There's something to be said for believing in your future. That's an extremely powerful thing. It's sort of at the heart of the idea of economic and social empowerment, is that you believe you have the ability to make something happen. And so you're going to hear a lot of competing data points today. I'm hoping there will be a point, counterpoint, and people who are much better skilled than I am at presenting real data and trend analysis. Um, so I'm just going to sum up my armchair observations by reminding us, and I will give you my disclaimer, I am a proud, card-carrying member of the Gen X generation. Um, so keep in mind that if the generation that came before all of you were basically walking around drunk, broke, less educated, completely emotionally damaged because they never talked to their parents, um, and basically miserable and extremely pessimistic, I would say that maybe being um, an optimistic, entrepreneurial, tech-savvy, emotionally grounded, yet financially conservative millennial isn't actually such a bad thing. So, for all you millennials, we love you. We love that you love yourselves. Um, and so over the two days, let's start to uncover these trends and dig into them because we really need to know more so we can have smarter policies and even stronger positive outcomes. So thanks to all of you, and let me turn it back to Reed. Thank you.